I'm very happy to be here visiting this amazing group. I'm going to talk about transaction fee mechanism design. This is joint work with my student, Hao Chang. So transaction fee mechanism, right? This is what we need um, on the blockchain because the space on the blockchain is scarce. But there are many users who, uh, who want their transactions to be confirmed. So they would all bid and you know, we run an auction to decide whose transactions get confirmed. Okay, so today Bitcoin's transaction is a simple first price auction. Essentially, suppose your block has size k, then you just take the k highest bids, you confirm them in the block, and everyone pays their own bid. Uh, and all the payment goes to the miner, uh, the miner who mines the block. Okay, so essentially whenever you mine a new block, this auction will be run. Uh, and you know, as, as we know from classical mechanism design, first price auctions, they aren't awesome auctions. In particular, uh, you know, it would in encourage untruthful reporting, right? So, um, for example, uh, you may be incentivized to bid barely enough to be among the top K, so you can, you know, still get confirmed but pay less. So that's not too great. Uh, and, you know, one obvious question is why don't we just use the classical body of work in mechanism design, you know, we have learned from um, auction theory that second price auctions are awesome auctions. Uh, and so how would you run a second price auction here? Let, let's say your block, um, you want to confirm four transactions. So you can take the top four and in this case they pay the fifth price, right? So this is kind of generalized version of second price auction. Um, but the issue here is like even the auctioneer itself can be a strategic player and for example, so here the auctioneer, obviously the miner, the miner can inject a bid, which is five, and now five becomes the fifth transaction, and everyone would be paying five, and the miner would be er earning more. So the problem here is like, not only do you want a mechanism that incentivizes the users to behave honestly, you may also want to in incentivize the miner to behave honestly as well. So interestingly, in this decentralized world, these classical mechanisms fail. Like the mass, vast majority of classical mechanisms don't consider auctioneer as a strategic player. I think there's, there are some works, like including Matt's work, like for instance, the credible auction. Um, they consider auctioneer as a player, but there the model is completely different from this decentralized setting. So, you know, there's a line of work that looked at transaction fee mechanism design, and all of these works, they kind of agree, okay, on the, essentially, a set of desiderata. So what is the dream transaction fee mechanism? So as I said, first, we want to make sure the user's best strategy is just to behave, uh, to bid truthfully. Um, and this notion agrees with the classical incentive compatibility notion in classical auction theory. Uh, but in now in the decentralized world, we want a couple more properties. Uh, first, we want to make sure the miner's best strategy is just to play by the book. The miner, miner doesn't want to deviate from the honest protocol, and this is called MIC. Uh, and uh, secondly, in, in this decentralized environment, we have like this smart contract, um, which allows miners and users to uh, collude. So we also want the mechanism to provide side contract proofness, uh, and, and specifically, this notion can be parameterized by a parameter C, and it means minor colluding with at most C users. Uh, they should not have incentive to deviate. So let's say the coalition's goal is to maximize its own joint utility, because they can use the smart contract, the side contract, to split off the gains uh, in the background. Okay, so if your goal is to maximize your joint utility, you should not have incentive to deviate. Okay, so among these three properties, again, these last two properties are kind of new in this decentralized environment. Um, and this is where, you know, decentralized mechanism design departs from classical. Okay. So, um, Tim, you know, started this line of work and he asked an interesting open question. Can we have a dream transaction fee mechanism that satisfies all of, all of these three properties? So, what's interesting is if you look at all the works out there, um, there is actually no mechanism that, that is the dream mechanism we want. Uh, and the closest we have come to in terms of achieving all three properties is actually Ethereum's 
EIP 1559. And this mechanism was rolled out like in August last year. And, and Tim actually was invited to do an extensive analysis of the scheme. Uh, so most of this talk is actually not going to be concerned about 1559, but just for your curiosity, um, here's briefly how the mechanism works. This is very high level. Uh, so the, this mechanism has two modes of operation. When things are congested, meaning there are more transactions than the block can contain, then it kind of behaves like a first price auction, right? just like Bitcoin's auction. Uh, and we know that first price auction is not awesome. So when the block is uncongested, let's say the block, we have more block space than um, the number of bits, then the mechanism kind of acts like a posted price auction. So what's posted price? It just means there's a take it or leave it price. Any bid that's at least this posted price will get confirmed and they pay the posted price. Um, however, what's interesting is all the payment is burnt. The miner receives nothing. Uh, and this burn rule is kind of interesting because it's a new element in um, blockchain mechanism design. Uh, and you, you might wonder, you know, if everything's burnt, why does the miner have incentive to mine? Because there's a fixed block reward. And even before, like 1559, you know, most of the reward is coming from the fixed block reward anyway. And because that's a constant, it doesn't matter to the game theoretic analysis. So in today's talk, I'm just going to ignore that. Um, so what's interesting about this burn rule is like you might want to ask, does the burn rule actually introduce more expressive power in decentralized mechanism design? And I'll try to answer that later in the talk as well. Okay, so oh, wh what I want to say is why is this the closest we have come to in terms of having a dream mechanism? So Tim actually proved that um, this mechanism satisfies all three properties in this uncongested reg uh, regime. Uh, in the congested regime, things start to fall apart, but you know, here is where we have this dream world. Uh, but this still leaves the question open, right? Suppose we actually have finite block size. So uncongested is kind of like infinite block size, and this is kind of like finite block size. So th the uh, question still remains open. If we have finite block size, um, can we have a dream mechanism? So let me first tell you our results, and then I'll go into technical details, right? So first, we prove an impossibility result. And basically, the answer is no, unfortunately. If you have finite block size, you cannot ach achieve um, all three properties. And this seems to have a pessimistic outlook. So then, you know, we ask, is this the end of the world? Uh, and we actually introduced like a relaxed notion that can allow us to circumvent this um, impossibility. And uh, you, you'll see this later in the talk as well. Uh, so third, because blockchain decentralized mechanism design is very new, like there are these new elements like the burn, burn rule, and maybe other new elements. Like we want to ask, do these new elements introduce more expressive power? And we, we also kind of try to mathematically answer such questions. So let's now dive into the technical part. I'm going to first try to um, define the formal model for transaction fee mechanism. And then I'll talk about our impossibility result. Uh, and then I'll talk about the relaxed notion. OK, so what's the model? We have a set of users and they each have a bid. Uh, so the bid reflects, let's say, how much I'm willing to pay for my transaction to be confirmed. And to have a transaction fee mechanism, first you have to have an inclusion rule. The inclusion rule decides which of these bids to pick to include in the block. Right? So the block is finite. You cannot include all of them. Uh, and this inclusion rule is implemented by the miner. And the miner himself is a strategic player. OK. Uh, and second, we have confirmation and payment rule. So in the most general case, so here I'm taking second price auction as an example. And we, as I said, second price auction is not great here, but it can still serve as a good example um, to show that it's not necessar necessarily the case that every included transaction must be confirmed. Because in the most general form, you can, in this case, if you want to implement second price auction, um, the block size is six. So you include six transactions and the top five are confirmed and they pay the sixth price. So it's important that this price is actually included in the block because the blockchain needs to be able to tally, you know, how much balance each user has. Is it important that the, act, the transaction, the five transactions in the block, or is it just like the number five that needs to be put in the block? Like in our model, it is important because like if the number five, 
the miner can just like forge any number and there's no penalty essentially. But if you actually force it to put in a transaction, um, like in the second part of my talk, I'll mention like even if you don't get confirmed right now, um, your transaction may get picked up in the future block and you may still have to pay, pay that fee. Uh, so I think it does make a difference in this sense. Uh, so this part is actually implemented by the blockchain. So you can assume the confirmation rule and payment rule uh, is implemented honestly, right? So th basically this looks at the on-chain state and decides who to confirm and how much each confirmed user pays. So we are always going to assume uh, if you are not confirmed, you pay nothing, right? You don't have to pay. Okay. Uh, and f um, finally, there's a minor revenue rule and this decides how much the miner is earning. Uh, and we are going to impose this natural constraint. The minor revenue should be upper bounded by the total user payment. Okay. So, but, you know, when the minor rule, let's say, is strictly smaller than the total user payment, that means there's some burning happening. You can burn par part of the payment to all of the payment. Um, okay, so that's kind of the most general model. And in order for me to talk about the impossibility, we also have to just define the utility, but this is defined in the most natural manner. Uh, so the user's utility, if its transaction is confirmed, is the true value minus the payment. Uh, if its transaction is not confirmed, your utility is zero. Obviously, you also pay nothing, right? The miner's utility is just the revenue it is making. Okay, so throughout the talk, I'm going to use these as the utility functions. So again, the statement I want to prove is that assuming the block size is finite, then no non-trivial transaction fee mechanism can satisfy both UIC and one SCP, right? So UIC is user incentive compatibility. One SCP means um, even if the miner just colludes with a single user, um, if you want to satisfy both UIC and one SCP, then you have an impossibility. Uh, so notice that to get this impossibility, we don't even need MIC, and this just makes the impossibility stronger. And we only need collusion with one user, and this also makes impossibility stronger. Okay, so this theorem works both in the deterministic case and the randomized case, but uh, for this talk, I'm going to focus on the deterministic case, because the proof is a little simpler for the deterministic So what I'm going to do to prove this theorem is I'm going to try to kind of understand what are the requirements being imposed by UIC, and what are the requirements being imposed by one SCP, and I want to show that these requirements are inherently conflicting to each other. So this is a very high level. Okay, so that's why we can start by understanding the requirements imposed by UIC. And this is actually well known because UIC agrees with the classical incentive con compatibility notion in, uh, in classical auction theory. A and Roger Myerson, who won a uh, Nobel Prize, like he has a famous lemma called Myerson lemma. Uh, and this basically um, says that if a transaction fee mechanism is UIC, then uh, the following must be true. So first, the inclusion confirmation rule must be monotone. What does this mean? It means, let's say, if my bid is confirmed right now, and I increase my bid, and suppose the rest of the world doesn't change, then I should still be confirmed. And, and conversely, if currently I'm not confirmed, and suppose the rest of the world doesn't change, and now if I lower my bid, I should still be unconfirmed. So this is a kind of like natural notion, right? And, and secondly, once you um, fix the inclusion confirmation rule, then the payment rule becomes unique. So there is a unique payment rule, and what should the confirmed user be paying? Um, okay, so it should be paying the minimum price it could have bid and still remain confirmed. So the way to think about it is, let's say I'm confirmed right now. And what should I be paying? So you can imagine I'm lowering my bid little by little. And at some point, I will hit a critical transition point. If I lower some more, I will suddenly become unconfirmed. And that critical transi transition point is exactly the price I should be paying. Okay, so if your mechanism satisfies UIC, then this, this must be true. So Myerson's lemma has another di the reverse direction, but we don't need the reverse direction, so I'm not going to talk about that. Okay. So this imposes some strong requirements on the mechanism already, right? And, okay, so we, we haven't used one SCP yet, 
Uh, and in order to prove this theorem, and I'm going to first prove a key lemma. So the key lemma says that any mechanism that is UIC and one SCP must always have zero minor revenue. The minus revenue always has to be zero, means everything has to be burned. Uh, and this key lemma actually holds no matter whether the block size is infinite or finite. Okay, so we are going to prove this key lemma first and uh, then I'll tell you how to use this key lemma to get the final impossibility when the block size is uh, finite. So actually this key lemma is also interesting on its own because if you think about it, uh, it kind of says in EIP 1559, the burn rule is necessary. Like you remember 1559 burns everything and Tim proved that when it's uncongested, it's the dream mechanism, it satisfies all three properties. And it, this is not an accident that they burn everything, right? So let's prove this key lemma. Uh, I, I'm going to do a proof by contradiction, right? So suppose there is a transaction fee mechanism with positive minor revenue that satisfies both UIC and one SCP. So I want to reach a contradiction. So how do I do that? So first, you know, we are assuming this mechanism has positive minor revenue somewhere. There has to exist a bit configuration under which the miner's revenue is positive. And let's assume that bit configuration is B1 to Bn. Uh, okay, so now let's do a thought experiment. We will start from user one and we will lower each user's bit to zero one by one. So I want to argue as you lower a user's bit to zero, the minor revenue should not change. So if I can prove that, then it's sufficient for proving this lemma because, you know, at the end of the day, we just lower everyone's bid to zero and the miner's revenue is the same, right? So, but when everyone's bid is zero, the only possible minor revenue is zero because the minor revenue cannot exceed the total payment. So essentially, I just have to show, take user one as an example. When I uh, lower user one's bid to zero, I want to show um, minor revenue doesn't change and that's sufficient. Uh, so throughout the proof, I'm going to assume the rest of the world doesn't change. Okay, so there are two cases I care about. Uh, case one is when I start, uh, this first user's bid is not confirmed. So, okay, so what happens when that user lowers, lowers his or her bid to zero? So I have to prove two directions. One is that the minor revenue should not decrease. And the other is the minor revenue should not increase. So let's do one direction because the other direction is symmetric. So I want to prove the minor revenue doesn't decrease. Um, and to prove that I have to use Meyerson's lemma, but I also have to use this extra requirement one, one SCP. Okay. So suppose it's not the case. The minor revenue decreases by delta when I lower this B1 to zero. Uh, so what happens then? Then I claim um, that there is a way for user one to collude with the miner uh, and such that the coalition can benefit from this collusion. Uh, so, okay. One thing to observe here is that because user one is unconfirmed anyway, right? It's unconfirmed in the beginning and by Meyerson's lemma, if I lower my bid, I'm still unconfirmed. So the user is actually just indifferent to bidding zero, uh, B1 or zero. Um, its utility is always one. So imagine a scenario where the user's true value is zero. So I, my true value is zero, and now I'm colluding with the miner. What should I bid? Should I bid zero or B1? And if you think about it, in this case, I should bid B1, right? Because bidding B1 doesn't hurt me, but it helps the miner by delta. So jointly, the coalition is benefiting. So th therefore, by the requirements of one SCP, we rule out the possibility that the miner's utility decreases by delta. So which means the miner's Revenue cannot decrease in this process. And similarly, we can prove that the miner's revenue cannot increase. And the argument here is symmetric, so I'm not going to do it again. So that's case one, and that's kind of the easier case. And case two is slightly more complicated. So in case two, we start in a scenario where uh, B1 is confirmed. If you bid B1, you are confirmed. And now you are lowering from B1 to zero. So I also want to argue here that the miner revenue is unaffected. Uh, so to prove this is a little bit more complicated, uh, again, I have to prove that the minor revenue does not decrease and it doesn't increase. So I'm going to pick one direction, which is, you know, I want to show it doesn't decrease. And the other dire direction is a little easier. Okay, so to prove this, I'm going to do it in three steps. Uh, first, I will lower from B1 to P1. 
So P1 is the price I'm paying if I'm bidding B1. This is the payment price when you bid B1. And next, I'm going to lower it from P1 to P1 minus an arbitrarily small epsilon. So this is a critical point because in this region, I'm confirmed. And when I lower from P1 to P1 minus epsilon, I suddenly become unconfirmed. And then when I lower from P1 minus epsilon to zero, I'm just always unconfirmed. Okay, so I want to show in these three regions, the minor revenue is unaffected. Okay, so the top region, it's kind of similar to the proof we have seen for case one. Uh, I mean, I'm, I can just do it again very quickly. Uh, so suppose by uh, for the sake of contradiction that the minor revenue does decrease by delta in this process. So what will happen, uh, in this case again, the user is indifferent to bidding either B1 or P1 because no matter what you bid, you are confirmed and you are paying P1 by Myers and Lemma. Uh, so if, imagine a scenario where the user's true value is actually P1, now the user is colluding with the minor. What should, it, what should the user bid? Should it bid B1 or P1? If it bid truthfully, it should bid P1, but actually it's better off if, if it bids untruthfully, which is B1, right? Because bidding B1 is helping the minor by delta, but I myself, um, I remain indifferent. Okay, so this means the user colluding with the minor can can benefit from this coalition, uh, and therefore it cannot be the case that the minor revenue is actually decreasing. Okay, so the top region is easy. The, the bottom region actually is just the same as case one, right? Because here the decision is unchanged. I'm always unconfirmed anyway. Uh, so what's most interesting is actually this middle region. When you lower from P1 to P1 minus arbitrarily small delta, what's interesting here is like I suddenly become unconfirmed. Um, so how do we reason about this case? Uh, so suppose for the sake of contradiction and the minor's revenue decreases by delta in this region, right? In some sense, if there is any change between B1 to zero, all the change must be concentrated in this tiny region. Imagine if the user's true value is P1 minus epsilon. So if it bids truthfully, it would be bidding P1 minus epsilon. But I, I argue that it's better off for the user to bid P1 if it is colluding with the minor. Um, and why is this the case? So imagine if the user is bidding P1. In this case, it will get confirmed, and it will end up paying P1. But its true value is P1 minus epsilon. So this means the user's utility is minus epsilon, right? It's negative epsilon. Uh, so it's hurting me a little bit by bidding higher than my true value, but it's helping the miner a lot more. The miner gets delta more revenue. And because we can make epsilon arbitrarily small, we can make it smaller than delta. So this action is hurting me a little bit, but it's helping the miner a lot more, and so together we benefit. Um, and therefore, by the requirements of one SCP, it, it cannot be the case that the miner's revenue is decreasing in, in this middle region as well. And, and similarly, actually, you can prove that in this middle region, the minus revenue should not increase too, but here it's actually easier because we can just imagine if the user's true value is P1, then actually it should be bid P1 minus epsilon because if it's bidding P1, my utility is zero, I get confirmed, I pay P1, my true value is P1, so I, I'm getting zero out of it. If I, I'm bidding P1 minus epsilon, I'm not confirmed, I'm getting zero out of it, so I'm indifferent to, to this, but the miner prefers if I bid P1 minus epsilon. Right, so this is an easier case. Okay, so that's the proof, right? We have looked at both cases, and what I have shown is if you take any user's bid, lower, it to lower the bid to zero, the miner's revenue is unaffected, so you can just lower every user's bid to zero, and you can conclude then that if a transaction fee mechanism is, is UIC and one SCP, then the miner revenue should be zero. We are assuming it's real. Okay. Uh -huh. Because I guess like here I'm making the assumption this epsilon is arbitrarily small, it can be made smaller than delta. So, it so seems like there was one of the previous steps that seemed like it might oh, be. Oh, okay, sorry. Th this I, I think this is the step where I'm using real number because for any delta that's a positive number, I always want to find an epsilon smaller than delta. So if like there's a minimal currency unit, let's say delta equal to one satoshi or yeah. uh, one way, then you, you may not be able to find epsilon smaller than delta. You, you had said something else in an earlier thing, and maybe it was just recapping the Myers and Lemma and how it applied, but it, 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 it Oh, yeah, Myers and Lemma. 
Yeah. That's right. It matters the number as soon as it's real as well. It seems like it goes the other way around. Is it said that like you can always make it um, th that there's a, a, a unique minimum payment <coughs> that's the smallest. You know, you make the bid the smallest one uh -huh. that is above, but there isn't necessarily the smallest one that's above. Yeah, that that's assuming it's r it's real. Like Myers and Lemmer, like you just lower lower until you hit the critical point where you suddenly become unconfirmed. Um, I actually I don't um, know what if there's a discrete version for Myers and Lemmer. Maybe, maybe. But that's actually an interesting question because my student and I we actually at some point we were discussing what what's the implication if it's discrete and. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm just saying, like, for in general, can is so this? If it's like anything above one gets accepted and one or below gets rejected, then there is no smallest bid above one. Well, yeah, I guess we were one. Get stuck on unless it specifically, you know, requires also not not that for a later one. Yeah, somehow intuitively, if it's discrete, maybe it's like similar to like epsilon IC or something because like this this one. I, I, well we, we didn't understand it, like we were discussing it, but uh, it maybe it kind of dropped <laughs> at some point. But this is an interesting question, yeah. So, okay, so this is the key lemma we have proven. Uh, and we just have to get from this key level lemma to the final theorem. And so, so far, we haven't used finite block size yet. This key lemma holds no matter what the block size is. Uh, so, to prove the final theorem, we, we are going to throw in the finite block size assumption. So, you know, this key lemma imposes a very strong requirement on the structure of the mechanism. Uh, and now let's look at what happens when the block size is also has to be finite. So again, proof by contradiction. Suppose that there is a non-trivial transaction fee mechanism that satisfies both UIC and 1SCP. Uh, and moreover, it works for finite block size. Okay, so what contradiction can we reach? Um, so because the transaction fee mechanism is non-trivial, right, uh, there must be a, a bit vector and under this bit configuration, some bit is confirmed. So let's say BJ is confirmed. So now imagine a different world. Now the world consists of B1 to BN, but also with many other bits who are bidding BJ plus epsilon. But there are so many of these bits such that the total number is bigger than the block size. So you cannot possibly fit all of them in the block size, which means if the world is like this, then some person from here must be unlucky and not included. So let's call that unlucky person U. Because U is one of these players bidding BJ, BJ plus epsilon. Okay, so now I argue, actually, sorry, I argue this unlucky person U is better off, you know, if it colludes with the minor and the coalition can gain, right? Because the minor is just indifferent, right? Remember, because of the key lemma, the minor revenue is always zero. So the minor doesn't care. Uh, so now let's see the, if the miner can help this user U. Okay, U will collude with the miner and it will bid BJ instead of BJ plus epsilon, right? So this is underbidding. Uh, and the miner will pretend that the world contains B1 to BN. And it will replace BJ with this user U's bid. So now it runs the honest mechanism on, on this bid configuration. And in this case, actually, U will be confirmed, right? Because that's our assumption. So now the user u is getting epsilon value out of it. Uh, and again, the minor is indifferent because minor revenue is always zero. So therefore, we reach, a, uh, reach the impossibility. So that's the proof. And uh, in our paper, we also extend the proof to randomized transaction fee mechanisms. But the proof is more technical, so I won't go into details in this talk. You can read the paper if you are interested. Uh, and then for the rest of the talk, I just want to spend some time discussing something more philosophical. Like I want to talk about, you know, how do we interpret this impossibility? Is this like the end of the world? Um, so I'll, I'll talk about some relaxed notion. Like I don't know if this is the final answer we want, but I think it's like a meaningful first step. Um, okay. So one observation we had is like in the previous modeling, uh, if you cheat then, so let's say you inject a fake transaction, are you a bit higher than your true value? Um, and because we are, we are focusing on a single instance of the auction, we're not looking at the future. Uh, so if your transaction currently is not confirmed, you are paying nothing, and therefore your cost of cheating is zero. So this is what the, uh, the previous model assumed. But actually, if you think about it, if you inject a fake transaction or if you overbid, and you are not confirmed in the present block, 
that, that doesn't mean our transaction will disappear. Like it's posted onto the public network, right? So it can be picked up later by a future block and it'll, it'll, it may get confirmed in this future block. So you may end up having to pay something in the future by um, making this advance, yes. So why wouldn't the miner just wait to broadcast a transaction only if they were chosen to like build the block? Uh, well, sometimes like let's say if you have some transaction in the block that sets the price, the miner cannot withhold it. Like it cannot, oh, I'm only going to review it if it helps me. Like you actually have to put it in the block and that, that transaction is there to, uh, to set the price and that decides how much the miner gets. Yeah, so they, wouldn't they just like only put it in the block if they win the block? And if they don't win the block, then not broadcast it. Well, well yes, but the, that, tra that, um, over bit, that, that transaction may, may be revealed, but that transaction, it's not everything included in the block is confirmed, right? So like in the, in the second price auction example, like you include um, a bunch of transactions and the last one is not confirmed. The last one is just there to set the price. Um, so it could be like one of these, like you actually have to disclose it and to gain in the present, but by disclosing it, you may lose something in the future. Yes. Well, this seems kind of unintuitive to have a transaction in the block, but that it's not confirmed. Like what happens? Like does the transaction automatically get confirmed in the next block or like someone actually has to like... You, you have to, yeah. Because it's already, it's already incurred the cost. So we are actually not the first one to suggest this. I think there was some paper by Aviv Zoha and others. They also used this. Um, so, so it's not a new technique, actually. Um, I, I don't know that it has any mechanism works like this in, in real world, yeah. but I think in the academic community, it has been considered for a pretty long time. Um, but you, you'll also see, actually, after I introduce this notion, like for the, even for this weaker notion I can show, um, I, prove, I can prove that it is critical to allow unconfirmed transaction in the block to have any possibility. If you don't have this, then it's still impossible. So the current modeling fails to capture this cost. Uh, and now the question is, okay, obviously, if, if we somehow account for this cost, maybe we can circumvent this impossibility, right? Um, but actually doing this is pretty hard because it's very hard for me to characterize how much you end up paying in the future because this depends on the environment. It depends on what other people are bidding. It also depends on the mechanism itself. So what do we do there? Like we don't just want to give up because it's hard to characterize the cost. So we start asking ourselves, okay, first, what is the worst case cost that can happen to you? If you are the offender, what is the worst, cost, the worst case cost you can incur? Um, should you inject a fake transaction or overbid? So the worst case cost is when I end up paying the full bid sometime in the future, and the cost in that case would be the bid minus my true value, right? So if it's overbid transaction, it's bid minus true value. If it's a fake transaction, the true value is zero, so the cost is um, just the bid itself. Uh, so I mean, of course, in practice, you may not be so unlucky, like you may not be incurring the worst case cost because you know, it, it also depends on what the mechanism is, it depends on what other people are bidding. Uh, okay, so in our model, we actually allow some parameter. Let's say I have some kind of discount factor gamma and you, you can also view like gamma as a resili resilience knob. Um, okay, so imagine I will end up um, in expectation paying gamma times this worst case cost. So gamma is between zero and one. And you can see if gamma is equal to one, then this is the same as the worst case. If gamma is equal to zero, it's the old model where you have no cost for this. Uh, so when, uh, when gamma is equal to zero, you should still suffer from the previous impossibility. So in practice, I guess one question, oh, this, is, this is called the discount factor. In practice, you know, it may not be clear how to set the gamma. Like you can potentially look at the history, use history to figure out exactly how you know, how, how gamma might be, what range it might be, but you can also think of it as a knob. Like if you, you can always set it to be one, but maybe you end up with somewhat more, um, you, you can always set, set it to be zero. Zero is like um, no cost. So it's the best case for the offender and the worst case for the mechanism design, designer. If it's one, it's like the most relaxed notion, in, in most relaxed incentive compatibility notion because it's like, the worst case for the offender, the best, ca best case for the mechanism designer. Uh, so it's, it's kind of like a knob um, that lets you tune the resi resilience of the mechanism. Okay. So under this model, we actually have some uh, feasibility result. 
uh, we call it the burning second price auction. Uh, and I will talk about a special case in this talk and I'll hint what the more general case is. So the special case is when gamma equal to one, we, essentially you're incurring the worst case cost. Uh, and let's say we just, we want to defend against uh, collusion with one, only a single user. Okay, so in this case, here's one mechanism that works. It, it's kind of cute, I guess. Um, so what happens here, uh, suppose our block size is six. Uh, so we include the top six transactions in the block, uh, but not all of them are confirmed. Only the first three are confirmed, and these confirmed transactions are paying the fourth price. So from the user's perspective, it's a second price auction, right? So that's why it's UIC. So now the question is, oh, what is the minor earning? So, so all of these people, they're included but not confirmed, so they don't have to pay anything. So the miner is not getting the full payment, it's only getting eight plus six plus five. And, and this part of the revenue is coming out of these users' payment, just don't, don't be confused. And then the rest of the payment is, is uh, just burnt. And so the, the, I assume all of the confirmed ones pay the same price. So yeah, they all pay eight. So yeah, so yeah, they pay total twenty four. The miner gets uh, yeah nineteen. Okay. So, so five, five is burned. Yeah. So intuitively, why does this work? I can give you a quick intuition. This is not a formal proof. Uh, so imagine uh, Matt is colluding with the miner and uh, the, the Matt wants to overbid. So it's raising, uh, Matt is raising the bid from eight to nine, right? Because this makes the miner earn one more. Like the miner is ma making the sum of these numbers. However, this, this action is not cost free for Matt. Uh, in the worst case, right, because we're assuming gamma equal to one, in the worst case, Matt may end up paying nine in the future. So it will cost uh, Matt one. And then now the plus and the minus, they cancel out. So the coalition is just basically indifferent in the sense. Okay, so this is not a formal proof. If you want to do a formal proof, you have to analyze all cases, and that's what we do in the paper, so I'm not going to do that here. Okay, so this is go, go coming back to Andrew's question, like should we allow the blocks to contain unconfirmed transactions? I guess there's a debate. Um, yes, Tim. So could, is it easy to explain how the mechanism changes as a function of C and gamma? Yes. And so, so let's first fix C equal to one, and just imagine gamma is, um, uh, 0.5. So in this case, the miner would be getting 0.5 times the revenue in this, this auction. And um, you, you would be selecting um, gamma times, so, so this is k, let's call th this parameter k. You are confirming the first k and then the next k prime uh, are used to set the, the minor revenue. So, so in this case, you just randomly sample actually gamma fraction of the top k and those, well, it, I, it's, yeah, you, you are sampling k times gamma users to be confirmed from the first k. Uh, so this is what happens when you change gamma, but c is still equal to one. But now if c is not equal to one, then you are actually sampling gamma times k over c uh, at random um, to, to confirm. Yeah, yeah, so you need to know what resilience you aim to achieve and then depending on the resilience you want to achieve, you can choose the mechanism. So like if I choose gamma equals 0.5, it's like um, still like I see for gamma equals 0.5 to 1 or something. Or is uh, the exact value of gamma to like the IC equals? Gamma, uh, the smaller the gamma, the more, s the stronger the notion, right? So you are right, if it's 0.5, then it implies it's like, you know, between 5.5, 5. 5. 5 is strictly better than 1. Yeah. Huh. Yes, Matt. But, but like if that's 
that's a genuine, you know, like if I really have value for something, then is what you're saying that sort of like I should really, I don't know, that like gamma is real, gamma equals one is really describing sort of like this very special case that you're really talking about cases. Um, um, not, not really. Actually, uh, I guess. Uh, if let's say it's over bid transaction, then the cost is the bid minus the true value. So right, like like no, I cannot swipe there. <laughs> if your true value is eight and you bid bid nine, you have in the worst case you have negative one utility, because in the worst case you end up paying nine. And you pay nine, and suppose your true value is eight, you are usually negative one. So, like, if the worst thing that's going to happen to me is that, like, I get confirmed later and pay my bid. Uh -huh, yeah, that's oh, the I worst see, thing. Okay, but you can't confirm it. Uh, okay, I understand. Yeah. You can't confirm it now because if you confirm it now, then there's a first price option and then it's not truthful. I, I, okay, I, I understand now. So, like, the worst thing that can happen is that somehow later there's some kind of like uh, auction. I wind up paying my bid. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, if, if it's confirmed now, the cost is already accounted for. Like, w we are just fixing this part. Like, if you are unconfirmed, the previous model doesn't account for any cost. Yeah, yeah. Is it fair to say that we introduce some stickiness for the honest users out there who can't potentially cancel cancel their transactions later because they were they just like you can yeah. Yeah, I guess th this this is because like r in, at least in some cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, once you post the transaction, you cannot retract it. You, I mean, it's like everyone can see it, and the, the miner later can always just take it and confirm it. Like it's not like I can tell people, oh, I don't want this transaction. Uh -huh. Right. Uh, so so also like for the special case like when gamma equal to one, where the it's worst case cost, you can also think of the notion as like I want to defend against uh, defend against paranoid players, like paranoid players, they only want to deviate if they can surely win. Um, but I mean, in practice, you don't have to have a like, really accurate estimate of gamma because this is kind of like, a, you can view it as a knob, so it doesn't have to be, oh, you know, I have to set it precisely. Yeah. Sorry, I have just another question. So in some sense, you can say the, the thought experiment I should really go through is once I post this transaction with a fee of nine, mm -hmm. at some point in the future, I may be included in a block. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, also, like back to Tim's question, like for instance, uh, in, in this mechanism I mentioned, like let's say when gamma is not equal to one, like you are you are sampling gamma fraction of the top k users to confirm. So if gamma is equal to zero, you're just sampling zero users. So this agrees with the previous impossibility result because the mechanism just degenerates to something trivial when gamma is equal to one uh, is equal to zero. So so this is um, Andrew's question, like should we allow the blocks to confirm unconfirm? Uh, contain unconfirmed transactions. Uh, so there, there's a debate. Uh, I, I remember at EC last year there was a debate in Tim's poster session, <laughs> and this is how I learned about this question. <laughs> Matt was also there. I think Matt raised this question: like, do you have, do you have to allow unconfirmed transactions in the block, uh, even with this new utility function, this weaker um, incentive compatibility notion? We show that if you do not allow unconfirmed transactions in the block, it's still impossible. Uh, so I won't go into the proof, but um, at least in this case, it matters. Okay, so as I said in the paper, we generalized this to general choices of gamma and C. Uh, so what's interesting also, uh, as I mentioned earlier, right, uh, I I'm randomly sampling a subset of the top K users to confirm. It's like gamma times K over C users. So which means like, except for this case, like in this special case, it's deterministic because I'm just selecting the top k. But any other case when gamma is not equal to one or c is not equal to one, it actually becomes randomized, the mechanism. So the one question we ask is like, is this randomization necessary? And, and it turns out that indeed it is necessary like if you want the 
transaction fee mechanism to satisfy, to, to be kind of useful. Like unless you consider really degenerate ones where only one user is confirmed or something, then the random kinds are actually necessary. So this lower bound is quite sophisticated to prove. Um, but so I, I won't go into the details here. Okay, just to summarize, uh, so I find the space technically fascinating, um, partly because like, you know, the vast majority of classical mechanisms just fail in the decentralized environment. Uh, so I guess our work takes a step forward in understanding transaction fee mechanism, but I don't think this is closed. Like, I think this is basically widely open space, and lots of exciting open questions. Our paper contains detailed proofs. Um, and again, uh, there are so many exciting questions, like for instance, how can we model this repeated nature in, in this transaction fee, uh, transaction fee auction, right, right now we are considering it's still a single instance. Um, how can we model the long scale strategies? Um, can we consider other relaxed notions of incentive compatibility to circumvent the lower bound? How can crypto help? Uh, okay. Uh, and before I end, I also want to uh, advertise uh, one new work, and uh, it's called Ponita. And in, in this work, we try to design a side contract resilient fair exchange protocol. So fair exchange is used everywhere, like in atomic swaps, in payment channel, in contingent payment, in DeFi, so on and so forth. And, and all the previous designs, like they, they consider only Alice and Bob as the players, and the miner is not a player. So the miner is assumed to be honest. So we basically you know, start asking, and this is actually one question the community really cares about because of MEV, minor extractable value. So what happens if the miner is also a player? Like in particular, the miner can collude with one of the users. So we design new protocols that provide resilience um, in this world with possible side contracts between miner and user. Um, and what's most cool about our work is the name Ponita. So Ponita is a fire type Pokemon. Um, and in our mechanism, we sometimes, like if, if you behave dishonestly, sometimes your collateral can get burned. So this is a way to incentivize you to behave honestly. So Ponita is a fire type Pokemon and it has special power. It can control its flames so it can protect its rider from getting burned. So because our contract is incentive compatible, <laughs> it will protect the player's collateral. Everyone will be incentivized to behave honestly and it will protect the player's collateral from being burned. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, actually, this is something we are we are thinking about right now. And what's interesting is, like, I think about 20 years ago, there's a line of work that tries to connect crypto and game theory. But I guess um, these were kind of more uh, theoretical nature. Like, the modeling is not a great match for today's blockchain type scenarios. Uh, so I think in general, it's this is this is a good time to rethink about this question, like how can we, uh, this question came from Andrew actually, so Andrew, uh, when, we, when we were working together, we had this question about like doing lottery, like leader election protocols on blockchain, and like all of these earlier protocols, they required people to put in collateral, and actually like I think the earliest paper actually won the Oakland Best Paper Award like in 2014, and then, then it spawned like a line of work that we tried to reduce the collateral, and then Andrew and it, Ido Bentov observed that, okay, there's this classical tournament tree protocol, you can do this without any collateral at all. Um, so we actually had some, after that we had some new results, like we proved some lower bound, um, you know, like log n rounds is necessary in some model, and then we proved like, um, if you are willing to relax the security notion to epsilon incentive compatibility, you can like, you know, be like, beat the log n lower bound, like maybe have log n, log log n rounds, or maybe even log star rounds in some setting. So, so th I have a paper actually in the upcoming crypto in August. I mean, th that was also like, th th I have like a, a s sequence of papers on this topic. Like, there are also different variations of the problem. That is the leader election, and there's also like coin toss in general. So, this is another, um, I think in general, like for instance, the question of how do you design these incentive compatible protocols like with small collateral? Um, minimize collateral is like a ge in general very interesting question and there oftentimes you have to use crypto to help um, and I think this is a good example where crypto actually helps. 
Uh, because if you don't have crypto, that there's lots of impossibility results. So maybe. Do you have an assumption that all of the transactions are exactly the same size? I, I guess if you're asking, like one, one trivial thing you can do is later when you actually confirm it, you can just store a pointer to the previous um, occurrence on the blockchain, right? So that can minimize the state. Would it then be cheaper to, would it cost you less to then get that transaction confirmed later? Because then it's like you've made some progress, like my transaction didn't get confirmed in this block, but then I would get a side benefit that later on when I go to get it confirmed for real, I've already done all of this work, so it's cheaper now, but then that would, that would I guess you're asking, should we design mechanism that makes it cheaper if it's already there to confirm it? Yeah, that, yeah. that I don't know. I think like that's a very good question because like we, we don't have anything to reason about this, this repeated nature yet. Yeah. Like and, I, and I wonder if maybe the answer is that it really is necessary to waste a resource and like you can't give the user a benefit that would spoil the incentives. So you have to make them go through the whole process of relaying the entire transaction again from everything that would cost them, even cost the whole network this extra redundancy, I and mean, maybe that isn't But I, I guess like if it's already on the chain and not confirmed, like the user doesn't have to broadcast it, right? Like, uh, yeah. You can just assume anything on the chain unconfirmed, it's already in the mempool. Like that, that you can, assumption you can easily make. Yeah. But the question is like in the mechanism that design, is that is yeah, in the mechanism design, should you make the payment lower for that user? That, that I don't know. Uh, that, that I think is like maybe, we'll need to consider the repeated nature and consider longer scale strategies. So, so the, I mean, the other part of that, I mean, I think it's related, but it's different. Like, is, is, are these results sensitive to all transactions being the same size? Yes. Yes. Oh yeah, that, that's, that's what you were asking earlier. Yes, we do assume they have the same size. So we, we, this doesn't actually, apply to the gas model of Ethereum. So that, that's a also very interesting. I got the lower bound. Okay, so the maybe I should put it, the lower bound holds for Ethereum too, okay. but the upper bound doesn't hold. Yeah. The lower bound, when we we'll have a lower bound when they're all the same size, right? So the lower bound holds, but the upper bound doesn't hold. Okay, great. Sounds good, thank you.